pillar that I agree with their analysis, but then I'm going to do what they tell me to do, you know. But it does mean within the context of movement organizing that I think we have the, the greatest shot at putting strategic weight <coughs> inside of paradigm shift if we have people with a radical analysis of power who are also people of color, ideally also people who have lived experiences of the problems that society is facing, who are kind of at the forefront, you know. And, and part of, I think, the thing that's hard for me as a white person, and I think for other white people, is just not taking up space, and, you know, it's just like being like, I don't have to say anything in this situation, you know, and just like, you know, leaving room, and also I think inviting people to the table too, you know, I think in the, especially in the legal community, like that is so white dominated, mm -hmm. just being like, here, sit at the table with me, or, you know, so that's what I try to do, is just like make space for other people. Um, and then uh, I think one of the things that there's this increase of group uh, in St. Louis, uh, like a white solidarity group uh, that's working with OBS, Organization for Black Struggle, um, they just went and had a bunch of white people knock on some doors and be like, we're canvassing about Black Lives Matter. What do you think about this and this? And just like, they, 80% of the people whose doors they knocked on wanted to have a conversation. You know, so I think that's something as a white person to be thinking about is just like, is there a way that we can be engaged, you know, engaging with other people to shift? Let's do, uh, I think, one, two more questions and then we we'll probably should. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll be the time. I don't want to be back yet. the boss so lady, boss lady. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, just a comment on something that, that, that hasn't been touched upon and, and maybe you want to respond to this. One of the things I think that is seen in these pictures and has had an impact in Ferguson was sort of the militarization of the police force. And, you know, it's not just the police force. It's almost like an occupying army. It's got military weapons. It's sort of their dress for frontline battle. And a lot of that has come, has literally come both in terms of the weapons and the training from Israel, which has developed a lot of these techniques in terms of how they're dealing with Palestinians. And it seems that one of the things that, that could happen is, is having the Black Lives Matter movement and the Palestinian Liberation Movement because there's a lot to be learned from that, because they've been dealing with this kind of Israel occupation and Israel militarization for generations, really. And there's a lot of practical experience and practical knowledge that both sides, I think, can provide each other, because the, the whole militarization is, is very much, I mean, Israel has learned how to warehouse people, learned how to control people, right? and they are very, and they teach it. They literally, a lot of the police forces in the United States are actually trained by the IDF on how to deal with minority communities. So I just, you know, that, that having those two movements talk to each other, I won't say begin talking to them because I know they are talking to each other, but that seems to me maybe a fruitful avenue to learn lessons that are just practically important in dealing with these situations. I think they help us out a little bit at the beginning I, I, yeah, there's a lot more I think it just needs to be developed. Have you ever seen um, the Detroit Palestine State Louis? <coughs> um, there's a really active uh, Palestine Solidarity Committee in uh, St. Louis, and they also um, worked uh, with a, a campaign called Delphiolia. Uh, Palestine and St. Louis kicked out this private water company that's also here now. Delphiolia, yeah. In Detroit. <coughs> So I think there's lots of things. Right, right. Uh, I believe language is important, and I heard the term POC used repeatedly. I was wondering, uh, since we're speaking on a black specific issue, you say POC, are you talking about black people specifically, or are you saying uh, people of color? I'm saying people of color. Um, so I, you know, like I said, I think it's a conversation to have, uh, you know, based on my analysis, wanting to create a, a paradigm shift in power and how we use and understand power. Um, uh, I don't put any particular, like, I, I think about power, not about race. Uh, and so to me, you know, um, a Palestinian, Latino, African-American, uh, 
have legitimacy, you know, as a, a more lived experience of oppression than I have as a, a white body person. But I think, you know, if you want to talk about like the importance of specifically black led, you know, I, I think that's a good conversation to have. So, do you want to speak about that? A little? Um, I mean, I just feel that when I'm speaking on specific black issues, I mean, if you're speaking about the wider, just overall white supremacy and how it affects different groups, then POC would be appropriate, but uh, for specifically black issues, I feel like making sure that we use black is very important because so often black people are swept into this, this into this generalization of POC, and it's almost as if this is the way you see people kind of go to all lives matter compared to black lives matter and things like that, and it's kind of like trying to speak black people into generalization when it comes to uh, support, but then. It's not that same way. We're not being generalized when it comes to how many people are being put in prison, how many people are being put at the front end of systematic violence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's do one more question, and then we really gotta, we really gotta break it down. Hi.